Any science fiction story that begins with humanity's expansion out into the cosmos always starts with Alpha Centauri. There are always habitable planets at Alpha Centauri and we make that first step and then we move on to the rest of the Milky Way. But are there any planets at Alpha Centauri? This is the question that astronomers have wanted to know for a long time. And the reality is we have no idea. But uh, my guest today is trying to figure that out. His name is Dr. Peter Tuthill. He works at the University of Sydney, and he is the principal investigator of the Ptolemy telescope. This is a space telescope that's due to be launched probably late next year, and it's been funded entirely by the Breakthrough Foundation. And it's one job is to search for planets at Alpha Centauri to watch the twin stars of this system constantly looking for the telltale signal that there are indeed planets. In this interview, we talk about the Ptolemy mission, but we also talk about just other breakthroughs in optics and telescopes and observatories and coronagraphs and interferometers and all of that stuff that's going to allow astronomers to see more and more of the universe. Not to mention an instrument that Dr. Tuthill designs. It's actually flying on the James Webb Space Telescope right now. So it's a fascinating conversation with a wide range of topics that I know you're really going to like. So here's the interview. So what's your gut? Do you think there are Earth-sized worlds at Alpha Centauri orbiting within the habitable zone? Ah, uh, start out with a tricky question. <laughs> so... Alpha Sen is so normally what an astronomer would do when confronted with a question like that is throw statistics at it. Well, the probability is this, right? So, and because of missions like Kepler, uh, which aren't very good at finding planets, let me say, let me just make some enemies right now, but they're good at finding planets when there's lots of stars to choose from. So, if you get lucky, um, you know, it's like it's like walking through a crowd and asking for a thousand bucks. You know, you're not going to get many thousand bucks, but every now and then, you know, maybe somebody's in the mood. So that's the way Kepler works. It it, it sort of, uh, you know, if you get lucky and you know, lucky being a percent or way less than a percent, a lot of cases, you you find a harvest of planets and and you you can play the crowd. There's lots of stars up there, so this is an easy game to play for planets like for missions like Kepler. But that doesn't work if you need to know if there's a planet around a given star and we've only got one alpha sen up there um but using data from places like kepler we can boil down the statistics and say okay um you know what's the chance of of a star like this with a chemistry like that having a you know planet within this mass range and this orbit range and those numbers you know miraculously to me because i'm now old enough to remember an age when we didn't know anything about any planets outside the solar system um, miraculously, we, we we can actually populate those kind of arguments with with actually some data. Now we know we know what the answers are, but the wild card with Alpha Centauri is the binary star. So binaries kind of mess you up because um, you know they'll there there are there are limited regions of stability around a binary. Some planets will get thrown out by the mutual gravity of the these two massive stars sort of railing around. So the planetary incidence in binary stars is a whole new kettle of fish and people don't know those answers but there are a few things we do know um, and one of those things is that the alpha sen system itself has two habitable zones one around alpha sen a and one around alpha sen b i'm not counting proxima here in as the third component of the system just the alpha sen a b system and those two habitable zones are both stable so if there's a planet in those um, Goldilocks zones around A or B, then it won't get thrown out by the binary. Um, but you can step back and say, bah, but could it have formed there? And, and that's where astronomers will all break down into warring camps because nobody knows exactly how to make planets. So nobody knows quite what the planet incidence is in Alpha Sen. But I, I think we've got, I think we've got a better than even chance that there's, there's an Earth mass world around at least one of the stars. And and I, I, I've got a gut feel. If my gut is where we led the question, I, I think there's planets there. Well, we've got three here in the habitable zone. So... Uh, yes, that's right. So I like those odds. Uh, yes. So the, the if, if you wanted to be, um, you know, to play the other, the other camp, the argument would run that the presence of the binary, which has been there from the outset, 
injected enough perturbation into the system. So it runs that to, to form a planet, you might need these processes to all run where snowballs clump up into big snowballs, clump up into, you know, you've heard these arguments and you end up with planets at the end of this cascade of mass. So the detractors would say, because there's this binary there, it's it just getting getting shoved around. You know, it was never stable and calm enough to get the snowflakes all clumping into snowballs, for example. So some of those steps in that chain might have been disrupted. But it's speculation. We don't really actually know uh, planet incidents in binaries very well yet. But the distance between the two stars is pretty significant. I mean, far enough apart that you could have a planetary system around either star. That's correct. So that's what I said before. The, 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 um, the habitable zone orbits are stable in that system. The question people would then claim, so if you drop a planet in there today, it will stay in orbit around A or B and it won't be perturbed by the binary. But could you have formed a planet given that this is quite a dynamically more active uh, sort of place to try and form something than around the sun, which is which is an isolated star? That's really interesting to me. Like, I know that we have direct imaged several other newly forming star systems, like with ALMA and other uh, instruments. Has anyone seen a binary system in formation to give a sense of, of how well they'll turn into planets? Uh, y yes, we, we've seen what we think of forming binaries. Um, it, it's a messy business, though. It's yeah. pretty hard to probe down there. Um, you know, star formation and, and this whole um, series of steps going from forming the star to having a disk and then to eventually eroding the disk away and leaving debris. Um, it all happens cocooned within this sort of messy environment, uh, lots of dust flying around. It's hard to probe in there, um, and you need infrared telescopes, which is why a lot of people in my field are very excited about James Webb, because, you know, it's it's really going to turn this field on its head uh, with exquisite sensitivity from, you know, this exquisitely cold and distant L2 orbiting platform out there. You know, we, we can do things with this new toy that we could never have hoped to do before. So if you ask me this questions in another few years, maybe Webb will have dropped a lot of those answers on us, but... It's, it's hard to study. You you have to do do all your work in the infrared because um, you know that the, the infrared light is the only way to penetrate into the, the heart of these very embedded dusty environments. Um, and the infrared doesn't work very well from the ground. You've got, you know, you, you're trying to observe. Um, essentially, there's no dark room to observe from. It's never nighttime in the infrared. Um, you know, it's always bright. The room's bright sky is bright, the observatory dome is bright, even with all the lights off at night. So uh, that's why everybody's so excited about these space platforms. What would you be looking for? Um, like, if you could, if you could look at the data from Webb of the analysis of one of these candidates from ALMA showing two planets, two, two stars in a binary system, what would be the signs in that image that would make you go, okay, I like our chances here versus, okay, this is clearly not going to happen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Actually, I, I am worried a little bit about my internet connection. Um, yeah. Let me know if it keeps being a problem because this, yeah, we've, I've, I've, I've had intermittent um, issues with it. So, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So, we already are seeing evidence of um, of things that are present in some of these ALMA imagery. We we see spiral density waves and plumes. Uh, we see mean motion resonances and all kinds of clumps and stuff. You know, the the star formation is a messy business, and it would proceed quite differently in some of these diagnostics if you have a binary forming in the middle compared to a single star. So I, I think that's a fairly easy thing to uh, to witness. Yeah, I mean, it's not like it's an edge case. I mean, the the majority of sun like stars are in multiple star systems. So uh, yeah, and it gets even more as you go up the scale. So right. if you uh, if you start looking at more and more massive stars, 
you know, the joke in astronomy is that three out of every two of them are, are in binary. So yeah, it, it's right. It seems to be that nature likes to form binaries, and it's a sort of a an intuitive thing, in fact, if you think about it, because the one thing about forming a star, everybody thinks in space that everything wants to fall down, that it's easy, it's, you know, black holes are perceived as these plug holes and everything wants to suck in. It's actually really damn hard to get something to fall because if you drop it, it just comes straight back out at you. It's a thing called an orbit. Um, and the real problem with, with forming things is dropping them down and having them stay down the hole because all they'll do is they'll swing by in a perfectly Keplerian way and come right back and smack you in the face. So the trick uh, to, to forming anything, stars, planets, is ridding the system of this orbital, ang this angular momentum, essentially. And a binary gives you a really lovely way to do that because you can just dump all of this uh, orbital angular momentum into the binary star itself. And you don't have to somehow invent a mechanism to propagate that angular momentum back out into a cloud and then, or a jet or something that shoots it off. So uh, it's, it's a neat way for nature to form objects, and particularly at the high end of the mass scale, this seems to be almost a necessity. So let's talk about your plan to figure out if there are indeed planets at Alpha Centauri. Let's talk about the Ptolemyan telescope. What is it? So Ptolemyan has an unusual history. I mean, it's it's been a really fun ride for me as a you know, as a scientist. Um, you know, typically the way science proceeds is you get together with some colleagues, you have some ideas, you 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 write vast reams of documentation for observant for proposals to get the resources to do what you want to do. But this one came completely out of the blue in a um, you know almost in in a thunderbolt. I was on a somewhat boring meeting with a, a panel discussion, and at the very end of this meeting. It was about when it was hosted by the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, um, which hosts a prize, but they also directly fund some scientific endeavors now. Like they've done a lot of work with rebooting the um, radio search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the sort of SETI program. Um, and I was on this telecon, and they, you know, they were, the funders were interested in whether or not there were planets around the Alpha Sen AB system. And right at the end of the telecon, the chair asked, Well, has anybody got any other? ideas for how you might go about doing this and there was a pause I almost didn't say anything and if I had not said anything that you know it would have the, the moment would have gone and I said well, I actually got this kind of half-baked <laughs> thought at the back of my head um and that ended up sort of pulling me into this funny rabbit hole of of uh the breakthrough you know the you know funded science by way of you know entrepreneurs which isn't something that I'd encountered before um, and the way things are done, it was all very different. So I wrote a white paper supporting my initial kind of, uh, you know, random idea that came to me. And I was down selected to be one of the two missions that, um, that Breakthrough funded to answer this question, is there a planet in the Alpha Sen AB system? And it's an embarrassing question as an astronomer, because as a, you know, this is the nearest one of the brightest stars in the sky. And astronomers literally have no idea if there's a planet there. That goes back to my earlier point about the Kepler mission. Yes, you can find a planet if you get lucky, but if you didn't get lucky that time, you've got no idea if there's a planet there. And we didn't get lucky with Alpha Sen, we know that. So the question is, um, there isn't really a, a workable technology to even do that. We know there's no transits. Radial velocity doesn't really work very well. It's it's a binary, which makes it hard to do radial velocity. And even then, you can't get down to the mass limits you need to be at. They were specifically asking for um, Earth analogs, you know, an Earth mass planet in a 1AU orbit around the Sun-like star. So there isn't really a technology capable of doing that. So... Um, my idea was to actually exploit the presence of the binary rather than um, most techniques which suffer from it. So uh, if there's a planet around either of the, the components of this binary system, the planets we're interested in in the habitable zone will be circumstellar. They won't be circumbinary planets. So they'll be orbiting just one star or the other. And we actually don't care which. Each star 
both has uh, you know a perfectly acceptable Goldilocks zone for us to find an Earth analog planet residing in. So if there's a planet perturbing one of the stars, then that star will wobble a little bit with respect to the the secondary or the its companion star. Um, and that wobble is absolutely minute. It's about 200 kilometers or so. And that's the amount that the Earth tugs the sun around, or another way to put it, the Earth and the sun both orbit a common center of mass. And that center of mass is 200 kilometers away from the actual center of the star, the sun. So um, we're trying to watch a 200 kilometer wobble at four light years or so. And if you do the math, that's a crazy, crazy, crazy difficult small angle. At 200 kilometers sounds like a lot to shove a whole star around. By the time you project that out into space, that's a, a really minute um, measurement. It's something like witnessing a soccer ball in Singapore moving by the width of a human hair. Some kind of you know analogy right. for how tiny a, a angular registration you need. So the way this is normally done in astronomy, um, witnessing something move is very easy. But the problem is establishing the frame. You need to have a very still camera. And keeping the camera dead still while you're watching something wobble by these amounts, that's the name of the game. That's where the rubber hits the road. And for Alpha Sen, and normally the way that registration is done, because you can't hope to keep a camera still, uh, the, the way the registration is done is use the background stars in the field. And you watch your, your star wobbling against the background field stars. That's all well and good, but background field stars tend to be very, very faint. Um, and Alpha Sen is very, very, very bright. So the first thing you just bought yourself into is a dynamic range problem. You're trying to, you're trying to, you need a telescope that can both image a very bright object in a field, and you very much care about the very faint objects in the field. You also need a wide field of view because you've got to sample uh, enough of these faint background stars. But the worst problem that that drives you into is that you need a big telescope because the background stars are so faint, you need to collect lots of light. If you don't collect enough signal, you can't make your measurement. So that drives this entire game out into big flagship observatories, right? If you're NASA, you might think about doing it. But with a little CubeSat, forget it. You can't collect enough photons. You need a big telescope. You don't need a big telescope to collect photons on your science target on Alpha Sen. You need a big telescope to collect photons on your background stars to establish the reference frame. But remember, I keep saying Alpha Sen is a binary star. And with a binary star, you can buy yourself completely out of that game. You don't care about keeping your camera still except for Alpha Sen A and B. So if you just look at A and say, well, I'm going to pin my camera on A, is B moving? Or equivalently, pin my camera on B and watch whether A moves. You've got your own embedded reference star right there in the field. So this idea of exploiting the fact that we have a binary right next door um, is, is the, I guess, the underlying realization that empowered Hmm. the first stage of the mission although i had to pile a lot of a lot of extra innovations into a cubesat frame to to hope to be able to make this measurement it's very very hard so so then you are launching this cubesat it's watching you're watching both stars or are you going to switch back and forth and how long would you need to be making observations before you think you'll start to actually get a hint on whether or not there are planets there. So uh, that's an easy question. So remember, we're looking for an Earth analog planet around a solar analog star. And, you know, we're sitting on one of these right now. Uh, we know that the Earth takes one year to go around the sun and that the habitable zone orbits about a year long around a sun like star for an Earth like planet. So we need to witness this stars moving on the sky over about one year. Um, and if you just saw a star of the sky make one wobble back and forth, you probably wouldn't believe it. So you probably want to watch it do things in a cyclic fashion. You want two or three repeat motions before you say, well, actually, I believe that's a planet tugging that around and not 
just some, um, you know, a glitch. So we'd like to fly the telescope for three years uh, in order to really establish that we've seen uh, an oscill oscillating motion. Um, it and, and the, the telescope itself is about a, a 12 centimeter aperture uh, small space telescope. And it's, you know, we've had to really innovate on on the way the optics works, on the way the mechanical design works, on the downlink, um, you know, just about everything we're pushing on this telescope really pushes the boundary of what can be done in a CubeSat format. So it's, it's in NASA speak, it's not a high TRL mission. And um, also in NASA speak, you, you really don't wanna be flying a low TRL mission, but you know, it, we're doing what we can with the resources we have, and um, we're trying to pioneer something new here. So the, we're accepting, and this is another thing that brings us back to the funder. Um, you know, the funding mechanism we have allowed us to take risk. So we're, we're trading risk for um, certainty over uh, and cost. So we're able to do things far, you know, go fast and break things is one of the, the sort of maxims of space flight or of, of NASA's sort of new way of doing things. Um, yeah, so we're going fast and breaking things. Now, was there no way to do this from the ground? Because I remember about 10 years ago, there was a similar proposal that someone wanted to lock a one meter telescope on Alpha Centauri and then just go for years and years until the data started to to come out. Do you really need to go to space for this? Or is there any way to do it from the ground? So the, the thing you're probably describing would be a radial velocity measurement. Um, so after Kepler or the transit method, where you watch for the start of blink as the planet passes in front, um, the next most successful method after that is this radial velocity method. And it latches on the same signal I'm after. It latches on the fact that the star is being tugged around by the unseen uh, gravitational influence of an orbiting planet. So radial velocity picks the line of sight motion, the forward and back motion, and my technology picks the side to side motion on the plane of the sky. Um, so they're both aspects of the same physics. It's the physics of reflex motion of um, gravitational perturbation. So um, if you were to conduct a ground based campaign, Probably the thing you would try first would be this idea to watch for the radial velocity, the forward and back component of um, the, uh, as the star gets tugged around. And you can do that with a high precision spectrograph. So you watch for the spectral lines to subtly shift towards you and away from you, blue shifted, red shifted, as the planet gets, uh, as the star gets tugged around by its orbiting planet. So the, in principle, one can do this in practice, um, the the thing that rules that out for this case is that Breakthrough was specifically interested in an Earth mass, Earth analog planet. Those techniques, the radio velocity technique, gets better and better and more and more able to make detections according as the planet gets more massive, so it's easy to find Jupiters or Neptunes, and those have already been studied and ruled out in um, in this system and it's easy to find planets that are close to the host star because that tugs the host star around in a rapid and fast um well it's both it's both a larger amplitude and um a larger amplitude of, of velocity and it's a faster motion so that you get more cycles of it in your data stream so both these those two things conspire to make the fact that it's overwhelmingly easier to find a hot Jupiter than it is to find a, a planets in further out orbits or planets with lower mass. So we're looking for a planet compared to the heartland of radial velocity sensitivity. Our planet is a long way out and it's very, very low mass. So it it kind of, it's got, it's got a cross on both those counts. So it, it would constitute a very, very, very hard target indeed for radial velocity. It's not to say it could never be done, but in order to arrive at the signal to noise that you would need, um, you would need to compensate for lots of noise processes 
which is attempt being attempted now, but is is, is not. It's certainly not easy. But I think about the methods of finding planets. I mean, as you've you've mentioned, we've got the transit method, we've got the radio velocity method, Gaia and missions like that give us the astrometry method. But I can't think of anybody who has proposed watching the side to side motion of a star. Has this ever? Oh, it, it's actually just. Oh, I mean, is this yeah, a, no, no, is it, this a common uh, method? Gaia is doing this. Yeah, no, no. Well. It will be. Um, so <laughs> Gaia is this um, sort of billion dollar class uh, space mission from Europe, uh, ESA. Um, yeah, the, they are doing the same. They're, they're latching onto the same signal that I'm latching onto. Yeah. So uh, why wouldn't you just do it with Gaia? They've got a billion dollar space mission. So Gaia, um, I mean, this, this kind of is one of the things that highlights my challenge. Uh, Gaia gets down to about 20 micro arc seconds uh, in its 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 final end of mission precision in order to see an earth mass planet in orbit around the alpha sen system you need about one micro arc second precision so it's a factor of 20 better than gaia approximately so you're saying the gaia um, isn't good enough is that argue. that's what you're saying Gaia's not good enough. Yeah, Gaia's not. It, it doesn't have a low enough error budget to 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 witness an Earth mass planet. Um, people might argue that you know, with with better and better data analytics, they they might push that twenty micro arc seconds down further, down to ten or something. Um, it's a long way down to one or two, which is where you need to be for an Alpha Sen. Um, another problem people have with bright stars like Alpha Sen is that most missions like Gaia will saturate on bright stars, so uh, they can't study them anyway. Uh, this is this is something I often encounter. So telescopes like Webb and Hubble, uh, you know, they're fantastic for a huge amount of astronomy. But if you're interested in nearby stars, often you can't even look at them because they'll just blow your sensor right out the back of your yeah. telescope. They 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 saturate instantly. So that's another problem for missions like uh, Kepler and Gaia. Bright stars are hard. Right. The the downside of having a star system that that's just so close. Um, so then, like, let's say you do everything is successful. Um, you know, after a year, you have this one candidate signal. Two years, you've got a you know a repeat, but. But it's probably messier than that. I mean, you've probably got all of these different planets in the system and they're all interacting with the star. Do you foresee any problem untangling all the different signals to get the planets that you're looking for? Um, the longer the data series we get, uh, the easier. It's basically like a harmonic analysis. It's, you know, um, if you have a, a recording of a a piece of music, as long as you have a significant enough stretch of, of the, um, the waveform, you can pull out different, um, different harmonics, different tones in that, in that, in that uh, recording. And this is in fact already the way they do it. This is the way that the radio velocity people find multiple planets all around the same star. They find one wiggle and then they subtract that wiggle off and then they see that the residuals look like got another wiggle in it. And then they subtract that second wiggle off and that's planet A and planet B and they put them, uh, you know, they put them into different bins. So as long as we have a reasonable data set spanning, say, three years, we should be able to more or less scrape the habitable zone around both stars. Um, the habitable zone around Alpha Sen A is a because it's a little brighter than our sun. That habitable zone extends a little further out and so you might want you know, a longer than a one-year orbit uh, to be studied there. Alpha Sen B is a little smaller than, uh, and in fact, Alpha Sen B is called Ptolemon, which is where the name of the mission comes from. So, uh, yeah, the star Ptolemon has uh, is fainter than the sun, so it has a slightly smaller habitable zone. So, you know, you, you might want to go into six months there to make sure you've exhaustively searched the, the Goldilocks area. So when do you go to space? Um, our plan is to launch in a, probably about the end of next year. I mean, the, the actual uh, hope was to launch sometime in the middle of next year. 
but uh, yeah, it, it, in common with many space missions, we have contingency in place, and we, we you know we hope to get everything built in time, but it might well be the end of next year. Yeah, that's that's exciting. Um, well, I want to shift gears now and start to talk about some of your your other work because you are a telescope instrument builder specialist. You've been involved in a lot of 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 missions, and in fact, you've got an experiment on James Webb right now. Can we talk about that? Well, I can show you my experiment. It's actually not many people that can bring their um, bring their optical interferometer right into a, a po podcast like this, but there's a thing flying uh, aboard the nearest instrument, and uh, it's actually exactly this. I mean, I tried to give one of these to NASA to put it in because this would work. This is this, this is exactly what's being put into the telescope. It's a small metal plate with perforated with some holes, as you can see. Um, NASA wanted to make their own one out of some, you know, special depleted titanium or something. So, you know, they, they made their NASA one according to the same design. Um, so what, what this actually does is that it takes the, it, it lives in my wallet, so it's a little bit beaten up at the moment, but it takes those lovely, um, you know, 18 segments of the web and it blocks most of them. Uh, and it allows light through this selected set of seven, um, seven of the web segments. And that turns this lovely big mirror that, you know, cost $10 billion or whatever it costs, uh, it turns it into an optical interferometer by way of wasting quite a lot of starlight, by the way, which, you know, is um, takes some convincing for the committees to allow you to do this. But um, it turns out that when you make a simpler pupil, when you make a simpler telescope, and in some sense it looks more complicated because it's got all these little holes in it, but it's sort of uh, limited the amount of information passed by the primary mirror to this select set. And that select set of segments that then propagates through to the sensor, each pair of segments gives you what are called interference fringes. And so you get a pattern crossed by many different interference fringes from each pair of apertures that is in the pupil now, each of those seven that are allowed to pass. Uh, and we can analyze those fringe patterns with really exquisite precision. And uh, we're still writing the codes to do this right now, but um, what that allows you to do is to make a smaller number of measurements than you could have made with the whole mirror but you can make those few measurements with exquisite signal to noise. Um, so because you get this very, very high signals to noise on a, a more limited array of information, um, that's quite useful for doing very high precision astronomy. And what we use it for is to try to find, try to witness the presence of faint com companions to bright, stars, where the hope is that a faint companion here might go all the way down past being a faint binary star, past being a faint brown dwarf, and all the way down into the regime where we're looking at faint planets sitting right next to very, very bright uh, primary stars. Uh, my data hasn't come down just yet. I'm still waiting. Uh, I have a, a program that should deliver me data within the, you know another few months. But um, there has been quite a bit of data taken uh, with this, it's called the AMIR, Aperture Masking Interferometer Mode, flying aboard the nearest instrument on, on web. Uh, and people are starting to get really excited about the potential for uh, doing new science with this. It's the most capable interferometer ever flown into space. So just as a demonstrator and you know on its own, apart from the science that it'll do, uh, it's probably taking astronomy and particularly space astronomy down a road it needs to go down one day anyway. I mean, if we want ultimately to study the phenomena in the universe, we are witnessing those phenomena on a stage so remote that we can't hope to build a telescope big enough just to make an image. And this has already happened on the ground. We no longer try to make one big telescope. Well, we, we do make big telescopes, but if we want very, very fine detail in an image, 
we don't make one big telescope anymore. We make an array of smaller telescopes and we link them together. This is a technology that's long established in the radio and it's rapidly becoming very, very effective in the optical. There are many ground-based optical interferometers now doing amazing work. And it has to happen eventually up in space. You know, we are not going to be flying single telescopes one day. We'll be flying uh, constellations of, um, you know, constellations of linked apertures that we then form interferometer arrays up there. Well, so it's it's a nice um, pathfinder for those visionary future well, facilities. People always ask me, when are we going to fly an interferometer in space? And I talk about the terrestrial planet finder and and other missions that were canceled because they were just too complicated. And you're telling me that it's already been done, that in fact, Webb is uh, also an interferometer just by blocking a bunch of its mirrors. You're demonstrating that capability, which I think is pretty funny. That's right. It, it's, it's, it is a... It is the most capable space interferometer yet flown. And, you know, as, as you can see, it didn't take a very, very large investment of technology to add this to one of the instruments. Um, in, in fact, one could argue the first optical interferometer flown in space was aboard the Hubble because the Hubble had uh, a thing called the fine guidance sensor, which used two small um, apertures that spanned the the primary mirror, and it could form interference fringes across a single baseline. Uh, and people did, even though it was, its primary purpose was for fine pointing of the observatory, the fine guidance sensor, people used this facility for science as well. So there, there are science papers out there that have exploited space interferometer formed by the fine guidance sensor aboard the Hubble Space Telescope. So you could say it's the second. Um, it'll get really exciting in my opinion when we're able to uh, combine this interferometer technology with the technology that's now becoming uh, explored more and more, which is that of free flying, um, free flyers. So what you really want is to be able to uh, maneuver and uh, position to very, very high precision, uh, an array of telescopes all flying in space and all pointing to a common, uh, a common target. And these free flyers are also something that many people are now working on. Uh, so, you know, that, that's the dream. And this is a small step uh, on that path. What do you think it's going to take? I mean, the US, they just went through their decadal survey and dialed down the capability of the Louvoir telescope, mashed it together with the HabEx telescope, and sort of are going through this process of imagining what comes next. But from the from the field of astronomers, especially the people who are looking for those exoplanets in the habitable zone, what do you think is a feasible, efficient, I mean, it, like the way your brain clearly works is that you look for hacks to get the job done. Um, what do you think is the is the kind of instrument that would give us sort of best bang for the buck to find that Earth 2.0? Um, that's a very different question depending on whether you're interested in a local, um, a survey of the local stellar neighborhood. So, you know, 10, 20 parsecs, uh, compared to finding, you know, it's one somewhere in the galaxy. Um, and I, I kind of credit here to some degree the the foundation I work for, the Breakthrough Foundation, for actually propelling the or, or making a distinguish distinguishing those two questions as being, and particularly the former, you know, the local stellar environment. So I think humanity and engineers and dreamers are really excited by this potential of uh, you know, an Alpha Sen or a Tau Ceti or a Epsilon Eridani, you know, th these are kind of, in every sci-fi book we read as kids, that's where, you know, our spacemen were going to find the aliens. And, you know, these are four, 10, 15 light years away. But to an astronomer, and I grew up, you know, you know, I, I went through all of my academic progression 
as an astronomer, you know, a star 15, often they're more, more annoying to study than the ones further away because they saturate your telescope. So astronomers actually, to be frank with you, didn't actually care that much about a, a lot of astronomers, not all of them, but a lot of astronomers were like, well, why would I study that one? It's just too bright. It saturates my telescope. It's annoying. So, so in general, astronomers are, are much more interested in, and, and rightfully so, in the in the underlying physics of the system. And if they can study that adequately well with their telescopes, they're happy with one that's at a hundred parsecs as they would be at one one parsec. It's you know, it's it's what's easiest to study. Where do I get my physics? Right. And it's all impossibly from? far anyway. So it's not like you're going to pop over there well, for a visit. Well, that's. Well, is it? And that's that's the trick to it. Um, and, and again, you've probably heard of a, an initiative called Breakthrough Starshot, which is, to be candid with you, a very, very future visionary idea. It's it's very audacious. Let's send a very low mass spacecraft on a, a very high speed um, technology to span those interstellar voids. I think it's worth starting to dream. Uh, and that, yes, it's we we have we have nothing on the drawing board now that could certainly get a human there and we even only barely have something on the drawing board in a theoretical sense that could get you know a one gram star chip those distances and even then a few miracles have to occur but and there are a few other points to make and one is that if we can find these backyard planets around our nearest neighbor stars there's so much easier to study with with a lot of technologies that are now coming. You know, they're they're well separated from their host. We can actually get clean spectra. Uh, you know, we, we can hope to probe those systems for the presence of, you know, biomarkers or uh, you know, telltale signs about the conditions on the surface. And these things are harder and harder the further away you get. So. Uh, I think there's really a value in 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 going after these nearest neighbor uh, systems. So is it some kind of Gaia slash Ptolemon? I'm just trying to imagine, like, let, let's say that you're successful and you do find planets at, at Alpha Centauri. What is the flagship space telescope that now finds all the rest it, nearby? The the you know like Tess is searching for close exoplanets. What is the one that really nicely maps out our neighborhood in the Milky Way? Um, I kind of think you're probably on the track before. I mean, a lot of the people I work with uh, addressing this question are talking about technologies such as star shades uh and coronagraphs in space so for these things you probably don't need uh and, and in fact you asked whether early on you asked whether you could compete from the ground the rising technology that may compete from the ground and is already beginning to do so is are these long baseline interferometers so um from the ground our best hope would be several major advances in long baseline optical interferometry and i've actually got projects uh at several of the world's big facilities to try and push along some new technologies to try and address that question we could come to that a little later on so can it be done from the ground is is still something of an open question it's much much harder because you have to look through this turbulent atmosphere and that's causes everything to dance and shimmer. And just when you were almost able to sit on top of these minutely precise measurements you could do from space, you've then got this whole new, um, you know, class of turbulence and error to try and uh, pull out of the data. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. So one point I would say is it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be space. But countering that is that space is becoming more and more accessible and it's becoming um, you know, a more and more a viable proposition to launch uh, significant payloads, uh, even even to higher than you know low Earth orbit certainly, but even higher. So new, you know, accessibility to space has never been uh, what it is today. So we shouldn't always think of space as this you know absolute Rolls Royce. You need this you know mega project to go there. And my mission is that right. I've got a 
basically the largest possible CubeSat that you can build. It's called a 16U CubeSat, but it's still a CubeSat. And we hope to do this flagship science with a low cost CubeSat in low earth orbit. Um, so I think apart from a ground-based, long-based interferometer, which I think you don't want to rule out, that's my, maybe the dark horse in this race, a coronagraph and a star shade from space would be my two other bets. Uh, and those two bets aren't really either or, they actually kind of work differently to do different things. Um, and I kind of like the idea of for the nearest neighbor stars, uh, star shade is quite good because the problem with the star shade, and I'm not sure if your listeners know what exactly what oh, a star sure. shade is, yeah, but it's absolutely big, big deployable flower that flies, you know, hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from your telescope, blocks out the star. Um, that's good for us because there's only one Epsilon Eridani. There's only one uh, Tau Ceti. So the problem with a star shade is all about maneuvering and getting everything. And if you want to go look at another star, that might take you a month, right? You might have to maneuver all these things back around. So if you want to look at one star at a time over a long duration, and those one targets are very high value, you're not doing a survey here, you want to know about Tau Ceti, then I think as, you know th this is a, actually a, a really useful thing to try. Well, and those ground, but back to the ground-based telescopes, I mean, these ideas of of partnering up a star shade with a ground-based telescope to go after one target, you know, uh, is a pretty interesting way to go about this. I mean, Dr. Mathers, that's his goal. So there's a lot of people who who are sort of thinking about this, this idea, like if the, if the star shade can be, if, if it's the same kind of technology as Breakthrough Starshot, a lightweight solar sail that blocks the light of a, of a star. And you don't have to get and you just pick one star that you're trying to observe, maybe that's the, the path you go is is launching these star shades for the 10 stars that you're interested in, as opposed to something that can go with your space telescope. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and the the ground based work is also becoming quite competitive for some of these things too, because you can win by just building these long, long baselines, uh, which give you that higher and higher resolution that that uh, you know a lot of my technologies are founded upon. And if if there are ways to do it from the ground, that does that does become really attractive too. So it's going to be an exciting future. There's so many rising technologies. And I, I think nobody really knows the answer about which are the ones that will really deliver on, on this promise. But I think one of the key things to always keep in mind is that ultimately we we can now very effectively discover lots and lots of planets. You know, they're often then maybe not the ones you want to know about, but this discovery is really a little bit um, I, th I think we should no longer be focusing on discovery. Um, we really want to be pivoting to, you know, characterization. What is it that we found? What are the conditions like there? Do they have clouds? Does it have a moon? Um, you know, what's the atmosphere like? Uh, and I think space is always going to have that edge. Uh, it's always going to be, in terms of the next thing, the characterization question, um, I I'd be, much more optimistic that we'll we'll get those answers from a space-based technology on the near term than a ground-based technology. There was a interesting paper that I read a few months ago where they were just tracking the exponential rise in the discovery of, of exoplanets and that by say 2050 we will know of millions of, of exoplanets. You just track the, the technology. What do you think is the technology that gets us there to knowing about millions of planets, and maybe to have characterized tens, if not hundreds of 1000s of them, which, which technology takes us to the next level, do you think? Yeah, so the, the discovery game, uh, yeah, the, you know, the more planets you survey, or sorry, the more stars you can survey with your high precision photometry missions, the more transits you get, high precision astrometry missions, the more you know, uh, astrometric wobbles you get. Um, so I, I kind of think that those games, I, I, 
I might make enemies by saying this, but I think those games have kind of somehow maxed out a little bit on the utility they deliver. We've got, we, you know, we've got sort of five or something thousand planets already in our catalogs. Um, there's still game to be had with more and more statistics. You can start to assemble, um, you, you can assemble a knowledge of the formation pathway and the evolution pathway of solar systems and planetary systems and which ones form in which environments and, and what the physics of it all is. You can constrain those kind of physical pathway arguments. But we're already doing that with the sample we have and we'll do it better and better with bigger and bigger samples. But I, I, I guess I'm not seeing the big breakthrough coming from that. I think the thing that will really catch fire with people's imaginations is when we can zoom in on one or two of these nearby planets and you know say well that one's got an ocean um you know and that one's got you know we, we can see clouds uh you know we can see there's a cloud deck at this at this elevation and there's you know there's ozone we, we we think there's oxygen there those are the next big things i think so those won't come out of these statistical you know harvests of millions of planets they'll come from the, the visionary space technologies that you were just talking about earlier, the sort of Louvois and the Habexes. Right. And the solar gravitational lenses is. Well, that's another, yeah, that, that you mean flying a telescope and exploiting the solar gravitational mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lens as a telescope. Yes, that's, um, that's very, very hard. <laughs> that's another <laughs> extremely audacious and, um, visionary future thing um difficult very difficult um uh, yeah i i i guess that, that i think that's a generation away from where we are now yeah. but you know never say never Do you, these things may work yeah i mean i mean i guess it's just like i mean i guess the thing that i find so exciting about all of this is that that the discoveries that are being made right now things like with James Webb and and other telescopes. These have all been in the works for 20 years in conception through build through launch and now we're seeing the data. But there is a whole other generation of these other projects that are in the works, things like Ariel, things like the extremely large telescope, things like Vera Rubin Observatory, Nancy Grace Roman, like they just it'll be nonstop. And each one will incrementally give us this new technology. And so we don't have to wait to open up our Christmas present of the solar gravitational lens. We can just stay distracted with all of the amazing discoveries that are coming out with all this other stuff. And then suddenly we're like, oh, and here's the first picture from the solar gravitational lens and a megapixel image of that exoplanet. So, uh, you know, don't don't worry, we could kind of manage our, our, our time. It'll be all right. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's it's wonderful that people are having those dreams. Um, it's it's very difficult to see how how some of those technologies are going to work um, and how we're going to make those things happen. But if you told me at the beginning of my career that we'd be flying, you know, a, a thing like Web, which which flies up and deploys eighteen precisely aligned segments. I would have thought you were dreaming then too. So, you know, it, it is a funny world. It goes both slower and faster than you think it should at some times. Um, I think there will be really cool things on the way from technologies that haven't been mentioned on a shorter time scale and that they'll probably change the goalposts. So by the time we're flying things to the solar gravitational lens, um, I, I think the landscape will already be different and that some of the things that we've been talking about here will already have been solved by other technologies. Um, one of the big themes in my work and in contemporary astronomy is that you know the the telco industry, the fibers and um, you know photonics on a chip. These industries have invested trillions of dollars, more than we could ever hope to raise in in an in a blue sky curiosity driven field like astronomy. So what astronomers are doing is we're using this, you know, vastly capable technology that empowers the model, modern world, really. Uh, and we're starting to use those more and more in telescopes. So um, 
using uh, the technology of fibers and the tonics on a chip, like a little computer chip all wired up, but where the wires carry starlight instead, and you can form uh, combiners and switches and all kinds of things on chips. So I'm quietly hopeful that we'll there'll be a dark horse in this race and that we'll surprise people with how well new generations of ground-based telescopes can be made to work and space-based telescopes can be made to work by exploiting the advanced manipulation of light that's now available to us that wasn't available to you know granddad when they were making grinding big mirrors and putting big blocks of glass and beam splitters and you know the the bulk optics approach you can you can reformulate an entire spectrograph now into something you know the, the size you know the, the size of this you can just make a, a high resolution spectrograph that would take a room uh, you can you can formulate that down into these tiny form factors now and that allows you to fly them you could never hope to fly an instrument that would live on a modern eight meter telescope let alone an elt you know they're, they're literally the size of a tennis court a spectrograph on the elt um so uh being able to lightweight and miniaturize these without sacrificing performance and while also in, in many ways gaining performance you can't even accomplish with bulk optics so I think there's there's room for surprises uh, in the pipe for people watching this space, watching what astronomers are doing with technology to answer the big questions. Well, I mean, I, I, what does that look like? I guess just one last question, which is, you know, you're sort of dancing around it. But I mean, is it a fleet of small telescopes operating as an interferometer using these photonic chips? to gather the light and process the spectroscopic data? What what do you think that sort of future optimized version looks like? And what do you think that gets us? Yeah, so last time we kind of brushed uh, around um, a question similar to this. I, I think it depends a little bit whether you're asking about the nearest stars. So the interferometers are probably more essential as you go further and further out. So it turns out that so a planet around Alpha Sen A is going to be about an arc second separated from the star itself. Uh, so for the very nearest few stars, I don't think you start to... Flying these um, free-flying constellations of telescopes is, is not so essential. Uh, you can do pretty well already with a single large aperture because, because the star and the planet are well separated on the sky and you don't need this very, very long baseline in order to resolve it. Um, if you want to start to uh, resolve detail and, and really visionary future, you might want to resolve detail on the surface of a planet then the game changes still again. And then you turn around, and you need really visionary future, free flying constellations of, of telescopes. Uh, so I think the next steps, if we're interested in the easiest planets out to say 10 parsecs or something, uh, I think those next steps will be taken by chronographs and by uh, star shades. Uh, and we'll get pretty good spectroscopic characterization uh, and we'll be able to, you know, probe for habitable zone Earth mass planets with those kind of technologies. Um, but we'll always, there'll always be a frontier out there where, we, where that frontier will always require us to build these free flyers. But just just how long it'll take us to get to that frontier, I don't know. And the, the separated telescope model where you put them all apart on the ground is already competitive yeah. and, and that's that's another dark horse i think that's gonna uh, be in this race right well it's it's a fascinating future and it really sounds like a lot of this stuff is going to happen a lot faster than we think uh when you do find planets around alpha centauri will you will you let us know <laughs> oh for sure yeah i'll let everybody know it's been uh it's been a long road and uh yeah i'm, I'm really excited to be in this chair now with a mission that's you know which is grinding, you know, we, we, we now have, um, we now have a telescope that's been made. 
Uh, we're getting all the pieces put together. We've got a under contract. We've got a spacecraft bus supplier. So it's starting to look very real. It's been this theory here on my, you know, on my numerical simulations and on my, you know, proposal slides for a long time now. And the fact that I'm I'm about to fly something is is really uh, really got me buzzed. Yeah, I look forward to first light. Well, thank you, Peter, and good luck with the search. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. It's been really fun. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than sixty thousand people. I write every word. There are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com/newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q and As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com/podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps the ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Gilton, and Maud so, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. 